for, for those of you who um, uh, don't know me um, and haven't pursued work with me before, um, I'm Michael Allen, and I've directed the Preservation Research Office, um, a historic preservation company that I founded in 2009. Uh, before that, I worked at the Landmarks Association of St. Louis uh, for four years, where I was the assistant director. Um, I have about 15 years now in historic preservation in professional practice. Uh, my office has worked in nine different states now. Um, we're listed as qualified in six of those states. Um, so we kind of get around sometimes. Most of the work lately, though, is in St. Louis um, and areas along the Mississippi and Illinois and Iowa. Um, a lot of the work we're doing lately involves historic tax credits, um, large and small projects tapping into state and federal historic tax credits. But uh, we've done all kinds of other uh, work, a lot of historic cultural resources surveys, uh, including work in Wildwood a few years ago, um, big survey out in, in Wildwood, um, as well as the Old Pond School nomination. Since uh, 2016, I've been on the faculty in graduate architecture at Washington University, uh, where I teach courses in history and theory of architecture and landscape architecture. Um, as well as historic preservation. Um, so that's another hat that's, that's on my head these days. Um, and um, I think that's, that's quite a bit about myself and um, I'm happy to be here. And I think I can share my screen, right? All right, excellent. So this evening, I'm here to talk about historic landscape preservation. Um, a topic that often uh, gets short shrift in discussions about what we preserve and why we preserve things, which are usually focused on buildings uh, and monuments. Of course, we've all been reading a lot about uh, monuments and memorials in the news these days. Um, but the construction of the land itself, how, how we shape land and what cultural significance that has um, is equally important. And maybe a lot of Americans think of landscape uh, looking like this in uh, Yosemite Valley, beautiful uh, landscape painting by uh, Bierstadt. These 19th century paintings um, evoke not only um, images of the natural world, but the sublimation of this space, the, the sublime, this great quest for the truth and hidden meaning of the world that was only found in majestic rock outcroppings sweeping skies with sunsets and big, uh, beautiful clouds, majestic oceans and uh, lakes and rivers, things that were beyond human control that were seen as veritable messages from God. Um, and that is also landscape. But landscape actually comes from European words that mean the sh to, to, that combine land and shaping. So uh, it's not what we find, it's what we find and touch that makes something a landscape. Uh, land is not soil, land is not rock. Um, the landscape is something that we um, have, have altered and manipulated either for beauty or utility. Um, J.B. Jackson is uh, one of the chief um, writers on the subject of American landscapes, and uh, I recommend uh, reading some of his writings at some point. Uh, he sort of defined our contemporary approach to understanding and preserving historic landscapes and expanded our uh, considerations beyond parks, uh, national and local, beyond cemeteries, um, beyond what I would say are largely categorized as pretty things, and into realms like highway uh, strips, fast food restaurants, trailer parks, bowling alleys, the common things that have a lot of meaning and may not always be pretty, um, but uh, often uh, are the most um, patronized parts of, of landscapes. So Jackson is, is an important person, but here he offers two definitions um, that kind of are in dialogue. The first is a portion of land which the eye can comprehend at a glance. Um, that might be that Bierstadt painting, right? You, you look at that, you, you see the beauty and impressive uh, nature of Yosemite. Um, but he's then suggesting a second definition is equally valid, which is the composition of man-made spaces on the land. 
So it is what we can see and comprehend as, as, as a certain unit, unity, like a cemetery, a park, or a beautiful natural space. But it's also to him, this composition of man-made spaces. And even Yosemite, um, a lot of what we love about Yosemite comes through management practices and designs of uh, Frederick Law Olmsted Sr., the designer of Central Park, who began shaping uh, Yosemite after its uh, incorporation as a, as a federal property in 1864. So laying out roads and campsites and then deciding what forestry practices would keep what was naturally beautiful, uh, very, very beautiful to, to the human eye. But then we, we had this blurred boundary between natural and artificial. Um, the landscape is the realm where what we think is natural often is something deliberately built, sometimes to fool us, often just to provide a very beautiful uh, view in our daily lives. So this is a, one of Olmsted's other projects that uh, is more of the kind of landscape that um, I'll be talking about uh, for the rest of this talk, which is um, a shaped and designed space, something that has an obvious uh, design as we see it left in this layout to tie together different parts of Buffalo. Um, but when you inhabit the parkway system, uh, you see a postcard at right, it's so pleasant and wonderful and the trees are so tall and old and sturdy. Uh, many people don't question um, how or why it came there. It just seems like it must have always been, these trees must be naturally occurring. And Olmsted sort of the master of getting us to think that what we're looking at uh, is somehow eternal and natural, when in fact it's artistic deliberate and man-made. The official federal brief on uh, landscape preservation is this one. Uh, you may be familiar with some of the other National Park Service briefs on different aspects like brick memory, uh, historic bridges. This is number 36. It was written by landscape architect Charles Birnbaum in the 1990s. It's still what we're, we're following uh, today. It's guiding uh, national, uh, state, and local preservation policies. Um, and it's under the title Protecting Cultural Landscapes. So uh, Birnbaum pushes the vocabulary even further beyond nature and landscape architecture uh, to include several types of landscape. Of course, the historic design landscape, like the Gateway Arch site we see it left, this beautiful rendering um, by uh, J. Henderson Barr, uh, showing Dan Kiley's um, alleys of trees leading up to the monument. Uh, that's the first type. Then there's the historic vernacular landscape, which could be said to be, uh, you know, the, the common buildings uh, of St. Louis uh, and make up a neighborhood like Soulard or the architecture of Wildwood itself. Wildwood has a vernacular landscape. And this kind of vernacular landscape often uh, is noted not just by land features, but by built features, including entire buildings. Um, then we have the historic site. Uh, which in this sense is mostly like a battlefield uh, or a site of indigenous settlement like Cahokia across the river. And then we have the ethnographic landscape, uh, which is a landscape that encodes um, archaeological information or settlement information, that the, the physical space is actually um, information, literal information, not the hand of God reaching down like in that painting, um, but artifacts, burials, uh, even recorded language or drawings. Um, that's not the kind of landscape um, I'll be talking about tonight. And here's the treatments that are recommended. Um, I'm going to talk about two landscapes that really kind of beguile <laughs> these, these approaches because I think this is, in preservation we, we, we uh, rarely do we have a uh, sort of a linear a path. We, we often as professionals are hitting um, forks in the road and we have to interpret what's the best thing to do. Uh, and these words here often mean different things to different people and different things in different contexts. So preservation is the highest treatment, which is basically retaining things as they are. Uh, rehabilitation is making something possible um, to, uh, to enhance, to, uh, sustain a contemporary use, um, a repair, an alteration. Um, and we have restoration, which is to go back in time, to, to, to um, put things back that are missing, or um, to sometimes uh, 
complete a detail that was never finished in the original construction. Um, and then reconstruction is this complete um, rebuilding of a lost or completely damaged site. And this largely is only recommended after natural disaster. Uh, in my field, we rarely recommend um, rebuilding entirely missing uh, features or landscapes uh, because then we have this question of authenticity um, because if something is fooling you into thinking it's the genuine article and it isn't, uh, that's frowned upon in, in preservation. That's not really preservation um, according to professional standards. But tonight I'm talking mostly about this fine line between rehabilitation and preservation, what to keep, how to move things forward. And I want to talk about two projects that have been in the news, one national and one local. You may have uh, seen um, kerfluffle over the White House Rose Garden recently. Uh, it was heavily, heavily uh, publicized, where um, at the direction of First Lady Melania Trump, the Rose Garden was remodeled. Its appearance changing from the image at left, which reflects its design after um, a uh, bunny uh, melon landscape designer engaged by Jacqueline Kennedy in the 1960s had created the space uh, to what's at right, which is uh, by a contemporary landscape architecture firm um, where crab apple trees have been replanted, hard paving has been put into the garden. The roses have been given a muted blue and white palette. The colorful tulips and hyacinth are now long gone. Um, this is the current appearance. You maybe have seen it. Um, there's been a lot of press conferences in the Rose Garden since indoor press conferences are inadvisable. Um, a lot of uh, President Trump's announcements about the pandemic or recent events happen right here in this space. Um, if you're not uh, familiar, right here is the Rose Garden location. I, can, I hope you can see my arrow between the wing where the president's executive staff work and the White House um, is facing... Um, the elliptical South Lawn. Um, behind this office bill, or this the small office building, by the way, is the executive office building designed by Alfred B. Mullet, the federal supervising architect in the 1870s who favored the Second Empire style. Uh, you're probably very familiar with his old post office in downtown St. Louis. Um, only three or four of his works survive from that period. This is the only other one in the Second Empire style. Um, like the post office in St. Louis. There is a customs house in Cairo, Illinois from this period that's in an Italian style. It's also worth checking out. Anyway, the Rose Garden, um, in terms of its historic precedent, you know, many people were offended that uh, Melania Trump dared to change the site, but the reality is the site has evolved and changed uh, and at least now three times different presidents uh, and first ladies have stamped their image of this space um, over somebody else's design. This is the original appearance. Um, it was a, a small lawn, um, you know, not, not uh, heavily designed. There's a drying yard uh, closest to the wing here where, uh, believe it or not, the first family's clothes would be dried on, line dried you know, before a gas dryer was installed at the White House. So a very utilitarian space that um, President Theodore Roosevelt decided to transform, melding a symmetrical um, Victorian um, flower garden approach to the general plan with landscape um, you relying on plants that evoked the frontier uh, and reminded him of his um, glory days um, exploring the West, uh, sort of also connoting the kind of rugged nature of this country uh, in contrast to the refined classical architecture of the White House. This was completely replaced and upended by Woodrow Wilson, who preferred this, um, these tall uh, shaped hedges with this sort of very private passage between the White House to the office building. The interior of these spaces then being sort of veiled um, so that it was hard to see in and hard to see out. This would give the presidential family a space of privacy. Uh, this was the design that was largely intact until the 1960s when Jacqueline Kennedy in 1961 engaged Bunny Mellon and Perry Wheeler, another a designer, to create this more modernist garden, which got rid of the formal enclosure, um, did not um, 
use any kind of hardscape, but just a simple lawn girded by low boxwoods containing some of John F. Kennedy's favorite flowers, bright tulips and hyacinths. Um, and then, of course, these famous crab apple trees. It's still a very symmetrical space, so it's taking cues from the classical architecture, but its relative informality is, you know, fitting with the modernist traditions of that period. And here's an image upon completion. Some other images in recent years. Now, by 1981, um, Buddy Mellon is a in visits to the garden that the crab apple trees are shadowing the roses, and the roses are not doing well and requiring heavy amounts of fertilizers to thrive in the shade. Uh, she recommended to Nancy Reagan at the time to remove the crab apples and have them replanted on the White House grounds to allow the roses to thrive. This bit of advice was taken uh, to heart by Omi van Sweden and Associates, the landscape architects who designed this current version. Melania did not design this herself, although she's getting all of the, the egg in, in her face uh, for those who don't like the new plan. Um, their plan obviously uh, removed the crab apples from the rose plantings, retained the general uh, planting beds and their designs, but introduced this hardscape making this a much more formal and classical space. Um, you can see now this garden really emphasizes the central entrance to that office building and creates a very formal enclosure for presidential press conferences. This is commensurate with Donald Trump's own architectural agenda. Uh, you may also recall uh, his attempts to create an executive order mandating classical architecture for the federal government. This is his taste. Um, the other presidents have been expressed in, in their um, incarnations of this Rose Garden. Um, the hardscape was necessitated, according to the landscape architects, by a need to make this central lawn ADA compliant. The Rose Garden was built in 1962 before the needs of disabled Americans were under consideration. So reporters and other guests in wheelchairs uh, using other um, walkers and other devices have found it extremely difficult to use the Rose Garden. And so something had to be done, right? And here's where preservation gets tricky. We have the issue of use and access in the, the, the modern era. And this is now a very heavily used space again right now, especially in the pandemic with outdoor press conferences. Um, we also have the question of ecology. Unlike a building, landscapes are living things generally. They're composed of parts that change, that respond to whether, uh, or like plantings, are actually alive themselves. And some things just don't work over time, even though the design intent was there. And the crab apples were very harmful for the roses and other plantings. And obviously the design has changed. They, um, Classical colonnade connecting the White House to this office building is on stark display, emphasizing architecture, emphasizing order and classical principles. It's not the less formal space of the Kennedys. Um, we have Barack Obama walking through it and left here. It's changed significantly, and those changes have been derided by many people who have said it looks like a tacky entrance to a country club or um, a, a luxury hotel or resort. Well, you know, in fairness to the First Lady, um, there's a lot going on in this design. Questions of access, questions of ecology, and questions of the architect's own tastes, which are maybe those reflecting the President and the First Lady's directives, or maybe not. Uh, the pr principles at this firm are well known for their re reverence for classicism in landscape architecture. Um, so it's unclear um, if Trump ordered this, or if they just chose, or if Trump chose them because of their predilections. Um, but what we do know here is they did adhere to some elements of what we would consider historic preservation while trying to make meaningful uh, changes to allow this space to be uh, a much better one. Whether we like it aesthetically or not is not really the key question uh, for preservation. We also have the question of precedent, which is what did this garden look like historically? We now know um, from, from the slides that it's had many different looks. So the idea of an origin point is extremely difficult. Where do we pick? Uh, well, if we want to go back to Roosevelt, we would have to reconstruct. If we want to go back to Wilson, we'd have to reconstruct. So the safest 
path forward is rehabilitation, which is exactly what happened here. Um, you know, again, that doesn't mean it's the best design. It doesn't mean we all like it. Um, but it is within keeping uh, of, of preservation standards that are followed by the federal government. Now, the other landscape I want to talk about is closer to home. This is the Washington University East Campus, which was no less controversial. Um, this is what it looks like today, at least uh, from the midpoint. They're still building the drive on Skinker, if you've, you've been out there. But the interior of this park is um, now finished. This is a space you probably better remember um, through this ceremonial alley of trees, um, the beautiful um, and strong pin oaks that were there since uh, the turn of the 20th century. Well, here we have changes that are needed, right? Here's the original plan from Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. This alley of trees on the right, syncing up with Lindell Boulevard, Brookings Hall Tower, closing the view on Lindell. So it's in dialogue with the rest of the city. It's in dialogue with a generally, at the time, suburban landscape around here. So it's a, a site and a design that's emphasizing open space. But really key to this design is accentuating the architecture of the college. This is a grand ceremonial entrance to the academic halls and this original quadrangle. So this axis and this LA is extremely important. Of course, the 21st century brings different demands. Here's a couple images showing its evolution. Originally, there was no driveway. There were two walkways through the alleys and a center walk. This was a space of tranquility free from automobile traffic. And here's another view. In the bottom left, we see Bixby Hall, which is still there as part of the, the art and architecture campus. And then the original University Art Museum, which has now been demolished. Now, Olm Olmsted and Frederick, um, or sorry, um, James Jameson, the architect of the campus, had originally intended for a village of professors' houses to occupy the southeast corner. That was never built. Um, but this LA is specified in the original design, as is the second tree walk you see uh, here that now passes Graham Chapel to the western end of the campus that has recently been replanted. Well, the university needed space for cars and ultimately the East End for, became a giant parking lot uh, two roads were built between the alleys. Uh, this became a big driveway for parents' weekend, many buses and cars during the rest of the year, pickup point for field uh, trips or the city bus. Um, not exactly as ceremonial or as tranquil as the original intent. And as the campus began to use the eastern space for academic halls, uh, more of the parking disappeared, uh, but this inevitable kind of question emerged of the center alley. Uh, all this new development was encroaching upon it and the displacement of parking meant the cars would have to go somewhere. Here's a view <coughs> right before all this started. What to do? Well, the landscape architects at Sasaki and Associates were brought in to study this and they recommended concealing the parking in an underground structure to allow for the construction of several new academic halls. The planting of a new semi alley of trees leading to Brookings, and then this sort of elliptical shape, which was implied by the original plan, but here it becomes much more um, formally articulated. There's a little bit of a driveway here, but cars are kind of kept out of the center. Um, this is a concept plan. This is not the shovel-ready design plan. For that, the university turned to Michael Ferguson Associates, another landscape firm, and Ferguson actually removed the stiff um, sort of rectilinear approach to the LA, called for replanting the trees, um, but put in a network of paths that were based on studying likely student pathways through the campus. So trying to study human behavior uh, and putting the paths in shapes that would lead people to where they were headed rather than forcing them to walk in straight lines or knowing they wouldn't do that, having a, a trampled landscape. Uh, Ferguson also took out this ellipse to elongate the um, LA and then put in this plaza space that's based on Italian Renaissance hardscape, which is a really kind of jarring uh, change. So they're really pushing past uh, standards of preservation uh, and introducing many, many new uh, elements. In the middle of all this, I just want to point out one of my 
uh, past colleagues, Jesse Vogler, who's no longer at the school, led a studio in which one of the trees was completely removed, the roots exposed. It's now, here I am with some of my students last fall, you can see part of that tree. It's now a nurse log. It's um, uh, will eventually return to nature, but uh, it's sheltering the growth of other uh, new plants in this um, sunken uh, garden. The Many of the other trees, um, the lumber was in excellent condition and the university had the lumber milled and some of it's returned to campus buildings as furniture. Uh, a lot of the rest of it uh, sold off and, and, and used in building projects around St. Louis. So um, here was a little bit of a nod to not wasting uh, ecological material. Um, oops. I guess it's my last slide, but in the end, we have you know quite a, quite a, a radical change uh, from the original LA um, and this sort of um, formal approach. Um, the plantings uh, returning, but the the orientation of of the trees uh, uh, to, to place altered. Uh, the the alleys are not planted strictly uh, in straight lines with the same species as they were before pathways are changing. This creates, of course, uh, space to cloak that parking garage, um, but it also creates more space for students to enjoy car-free recreational areas between these academic halls. So we have the new architecture building, Weill Hall at left, these pavilions, new engineering school buildings on the right. Um, you know, this is now a uh, crossing for these in uh, the campus. It's no longer a kind of dead uh, end of the, the school. Um, some of the other issues here, though, um, that you don't see is that the parking garage roof structure is not very porous, so the trees are living in little concrete boxes that can accommodate root growth, but they're really constrained. Uh, over the long term, we'll test and see the viability of that planting. The grass has to be watered daily or it will die because the soil isn't deep enough for tap roots to develop. So this is a very fragile landscape, um, huge changes. Um, and some people resisted this. Some people thought the LA was sacred, um, but the university barely gave much of a thought to preserving it. It's, it's agenda for creating new academic halls. And this giant parking garage uh, was kind of set in stone by the end of the, the first decade of this uh, 21st century. And the trees that have returned, the new pin oaks, have been planted in the last 18 years. They've been growing at Tyson Research Center so that when they arrived here, they weren't little tiny babies, um, but at least um, <laughs> kindergarten age. So they're a little taller and they don't look uh, quite as anemic. Uh, but this is a huge transformation. And from a preservation standpoint, um, you know, this follows none of the preservation brief standards. This wouldn't even... Uh, be considered rehabilitation. This is really a new design supplanting uh, the historic design. Um, whereas the Rose Garden project, I think is, it represents a careful attempt at trying to adhere to preservation uh, planning. Now, you know, you may like one more than the other, um, and I'm happy to, to discuss this. Um, but I think this also shows kind of the complexity of landscape. One other thing I'll, I'll note uh, is in terms of historic preservation, in terms of the more normal landscapes you might be thinking about, uh, a design garden in a backyard of a large home or um, a, a small cemetery or a small park, many National Register nominations and many architectural surveys do not note landscape features. If you look at historic districts around the world, around the country, and you read the descriptions, it's usually a description of buildings only. And it's very rare that anything about the landscape is mentioned, even though the shape of the land, the relationship of the house uh, to, to tree plantings, to other houses, to the street itself, those are all indelible parts of the historic built environment. Um, and um, you, about 10 years ago, I did a survey in St. Louis Place neighborhood that led to a National Register nomination, and we actually recorded uh, landscape features like walls and pathways when they were original or from the historic period, and they're actually noted, um, which is, you know, good from a heritage perspective because those things now have a little more protection, although we know National Register isn't the ultimate, it's local designation that really counts. Um, but also when people are using tax credits, 
you only get the tax credits for what's recorded as historic. So if it just mentions the house and you have this beautiful retaining wall, you're not going to get any tax credits for, for renovating it if it's not mentioned in that document. So um, that's a disincentive to doing the right thing and restoring it or, or, or repairing it, right? So um, if you see sometimes the limestone walls taken out and split face concrete put back, it's uh, even on a historic project, all, uh, sometimes it does come down to the fact that A, that's not protected and B, there's no real financial incentive for for keeping those features intact. So I'm a huge advocate for expanding our consciousness around preservation to think more about landscape uh, and the settings of buildings um, and how that shapes what we uh, view as our uh, common shared past. And I'm gonna stop right there. Well done, Michael. Yeah, any, uh... Does anybody have any, uh, you know, I personally think that rose, uh, rose garden example, uh, that was pretty interesting. And they, it, I, I think they did a good job. It kind of mixed all the, all the history. And, uh, and, and uh, I think that that was a, it looked like a good project to me. Uh, Washington University is a little more stark I, it, to me. It's, that was a big change. <laughs> I tend to agree on both of those points. Um, you know, I think, I think obviously the Rose Garden is very political. So <laughs> peeling back the politics and looking at the actual plan, I think is important. Um, I, I actually think the first lady, you know, if she directed this, I don't know how involved she really was, if, but she showed good judgment because they, they could have done something. They could have tore that all out and built their own garden, which is what has happened there before. It looks like it, yeah, it looks like it has been done before, so, because <laughs> that, there were some big changes that's, that's from the original. Ripped out Woodrow Wilson's garden, and Woodrow Wilson ripped out Teddy Roosevelt's garden, <laughs> so. I, I've got a, a question. Of, how do we make this apply to Wildwood? Because I'm thinking... I live in a house that was built in the 1850s. I've got a brick patio outside. I don't think there was a brick patio in the 1850s. How do, I mean, we've got a lot of old houses that have been, these, their sites have been modernized or adapted to suit their, their use today. Do we try to replicate something from the past do we i mean everything that was there before is pretty much gone now what's what's the approach what should we encourage people to do yeah that's a good question i i think um yeah <laughs> personal taste is always the, the great inhibitor um as you know um and that's almost unstoppable but I, I you know I do think um, obviously the pa patios decks are people better want to want those things and I think you know from from a preservation standpoint I'm not too irritated when those things appear because they they give use in life and some personal expression to a property but I, I'm more worried in terms of you know with anything that's sort of discernible from a historic period is altered like um you know if people carve into the the site to build a, a large garage or or run a giant driveway uh where historically that was open lawn um th those are things that i think are i would discourage uh more to to, to cut up the, the property in the setting uh, because that's how a 19th century farmhouse starts looking like a 21st century suburban house and again People wanted to probably, and a lot, you know, maybe it's going to be hard to talk them out of it. And, and ultimately, you can't prevent them from doing that uh, necessarily. But um, you know, I think the relationship of the building to its site is is important more so than a small patio or, or, or deck on the back. Um, I hope okay. that's helpful. Okay. Well, I, I this sort of ties you. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. 
Pond, the Pond School is a good example of, you know, we just, uh, uh, you know, fixed the, the stones on the front. And that, and that whole wall in front of the Pond School, I mean, you know, if, you, if that wasn't maintained and preserved, it would take, it would take a bunch out of that site. I know the back, the back end, there's been changes made back there, but sorry about that. But that, that wall is critical to the site. I agree. Well, I'm thinking of one thing. We've got uh, this Essen log cabin that we'll be re-erecting. Now, I think my idea would be we try to replicate what's there. Now, it's, and to come up with an image of what it would have been like around a... Uh, uh, pre turn of the century uh, farm cabin is that and uh, yet it becomes a copy it's not a farm it's it's not real but it's something that people can see and see what it, it would have been like then no and I, I would I would agree with that personally um, I'm not as dismissive of reconstruction is a lot of my colleagues <laughs> because if you're reconstructing that cabin and to me it, it deserves to be in a period appropriate setting um, and the building's already being reconstructed if I, if I understand correctly so what are you going to do like not reconstruct the building would be the the choice a lot of my colleagues would say oh it's, it's going to be fake you know um, I, I don't agree because it's still the original building, you know, even if it's in a different location. And I, I have, I have actually in, in Edwardsville got a train station listed in a historic district that had been relocated. It was relocated to save it from demolition. And for years it wasn't included in the district in the national register because it had been relocated. But um, I fought it successfully and got it in there because there, you couldn't even put it back in its original location. That site doesn't exist in the same way because of a road construction. <laughs> so what are you supposed to do? Condemn that structure to an eternity of not being it not historic officially? It's like, no, because <laughs> then that means it's vulnerable to, to being demolished yeah. again. <laughs> so. I think and the, the other thing, I mean, especially with that... Uh, the rose garden type of thing, it has changed and everything has changed because just to take our house, it was a log cabin. It was built in the 1850s. It's been added on to in the late 1800s. It was recited probably then. I mean, various things have gone on. When is it not historic? I mean, things change and it's ad adapted. What do we say? Okay, well, in the last 20 years, any change or adaptation is not historical. Well, it will be in 100 years. So, mm -hmm. Good so point. I, I think and the, the uh, Rose Garden, you know, it adapts to what the, what the needs are now. And uh, I think it's, and I think it's reflective of the original design of the structure around it now. Besides how I feel about the Trumps, I I think it's a very, I like the, the Rose Guard. Mm -hmm. These are all good points. Thanks for Chris giving the back, the back view of uh, the Pond School there. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> you mean the kids I was didn't park show their the front cars side. back there? <laughs> No cars right. in the picture. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> but I do well, uh, think the Pond School is a good example of you get the image, the, the front of that school looks like it always did. Yet the backside has the, uh, the modern additions that we have to have. We have to have parking. We have to have a playground. Things like that. Uh, but the fact is that the building appears from the front. They've kept the front very accurate. So I, yeah, that's what I think is a good job on, on the uh, school. Well, 
Uh, thanks, Michael. We appreciate your, uh, you've, you've op I think you've opened up everybody's minds to, to a little different way of thinking about landscapes and how it, how it, how it works in with the historic architecture of the place. Good. I'm happy to help. <laughs> so it's good to see everyone again. Thank you, Michael. Well done again. Thank you very much. Thank you.